Have you ever been curious about the psychology behind Valve's game design process? Mike Ambender, senior experimental psychologist at Valve, is here to tell you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. I very much appreciate it. So as the, the, the voice from overhead said, my name is Mike Amender. I'm an experimental psychologist at Valve. Um, I'm going to speak to you guys today about how the, uh, the I guess, the, the science of game design can, can inform the, the science of games for change, or at least how, how we believe the science of game design could potentially um, inform games that are, that are trying to make a social impact. So this is an example of, of me at work, uh, being a psychologist at a game company. Uh, that's our, our CEO, Gabe. Um, this, this is actually not what I do. Um, my background is in, in visual cognition. I'm a research psychologist, not a clinician. Um, you know, if, if Gabe needs help, I'm happy to provide assistance. But uh, broadly speaking, uh, what I work on is the application of knowledge and methodologies uh, from psychology and applying them to game design. So a really quick summary of, of what I'll talk about today is I'll, I'll walk you guys through our approach to game design. Um, then I'll look at it through the lens of a psychologist in the games industry. And so I'll walk you through a specific example of, of the psychological science of, of game design and, and have that hopefully lead into a, a quick discussion of, of how we, I guess the importance that we place on measuring the impact of our decisions and, and hopefully how that relates to, to making games for change as well. And really the, the underlying thread um, running throughout this talk, uh, in essence, is, is how would Valve, how would a game, a, a company that makes games for entertainment, make a game for change? So if you like um, Valve games, if you're familiar with our games, this is how we make games. It's a, it's a really simple process. Uh, we have game designs and, and they're just hypotheses. Um, they're just things we think customers might like. Um, game mechanics we think customers might enjoy. Um, to, to test them, to evaluate them, we run play tests. We put the, the game mechanic in front of people who, who aren't us, um, people outside the company. Uh, we do this as often as we can, as early as we can. Um, and you know, these are experiments. And, and we gather feedback from, from these play tests. You know, this is data, these are observations. And then we take that data and we iterate and, iterate and improve the game. This is how we make games. It's a, it's a really straightforward process. We have ideas and we test them. And then we gather data um, from those tests and then try and improve the process. This is the, the, the same thing I just said, but in visual form. Uh, we have, you know, we create content, um, at least hypotheses about, you know, the, these mechanics working in various ways. Uh, we run play tests, we gather feedback from those play tests, and um, then we create more content. And, and we keep doing, we iterate through the cycle over and over until we get to a point where we're happy with the game design. I made that graph cyclical to, to show you this graph, which might remind you of something you, you learned about in first grade. It's the scientific method. Um, it's, it's how we create knowledge. It's the single best way we have of creating knowledge. And it's how we make games. Um, it, you have data that leads to theories that lead to hypotheses that you can make that you then test. And that leads to, to more data and more theories and more experiments and more tests. Um, it, it's a very straightforward analytical um, approach to making games and it, it seems to work very well for us. And so uh, really, I mean, I want to, I can't, I guess I can't emphasize enough just how important the scientific method is to both how we create knowledge, but how we create games and to how we create in general. Um, this is not meant to be, uh, I guess, and not meant to place too much of an emphasis on kind of an analytical or um, uh, rigorous approach to making games. It's more of just how we think about assessing the efficacy of, of our game designs. Um, we need a way of doing that, and, and the best way we know how is to use the scientific method. And so we have really creative people who come up with really creative game designs, and then we test them. Um, and that leads to, you know, hopefully what are really enjoyable games. So I'm a psychologist in the games industry. Um, and let me walk you guys through an example of how I, as a psychologist, would use the scientific method um, and try and actually, you know, create a game mechanic that has an impact on, on our players and induces a change in behavior. So walking through the logic very quickly, humans play games and humans are influenced. And what psychologists do is study the influences on human behavior. We want to know why people do what they do. Um, how what happens out in the real world affects mental representations and how mental representations affects our perception of what happens out in the real world. 
And so at a game company, I get to be a psychologist who looks at the influences on human behavior inside of games. And so let's pick one specific example. So if you've gone online before, if you've been on the internet, uh, you may have noticed that people behave a little bit differently. Um, there are a variety of reasons for this. I, li I listed some of them. I'm not going to walk through them, really. But you may have noticed a, a tendency to act uh, perhaps a little negatively um, on occasion. Uh, sometimes people are not always the nicest. And so uh, the question that I want to pose to you guys, and it, it's somewhat of a rhetorical question because I'm in the middle of a talk, um, is that does reducing negative behavior, um, does re reducing the occurrences of people being mean to each other in an online game make it a game for change? Um, just something to think about, something to chew on. And so here's an example of some, some hypothetical uh, chat text in one of our games. I'll read it through really quickly. This is how we would love uh, players to act. Hello, good sir. I am new to Dota. This is one of our games. Any advice for playing Helicopter Man? Greetings, Dota citizen. I relish the opportunity to share my expertise with a new player. Fantastic. In other news, I have recently died. Not a problem, friend. I will prepare some rational, constructive feedback to help you learn the game. Um, this, of course, is sometimes how people talk. Not really, though. Um, but, but often people can be a little bit more negative in games. And so um, trying to reduce the, uh, the occurrences of people treating each other negatively or uncooperatively in games um, is a real, would be a really useful thing we could do if we could figure out a way. And so this is an example of, of how we want people to behave. There are lots of instances of people not behaving so nice. How can we actually make an impact? How can we actually change behavior in a game? So there's a phenomenon in psychology known as cognitive dissonance. I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but to give you a simplified definition, it's, it's the notion that we get a sense of discomfort um, when we're holding two conflicting notions in mind. Um, you know, as an example, uh, if you think you're a charitable person and you walk by a homeless person asking for money and you don't give them money, um, that can lead to cognitive dissonance. If you think you're a really good public speaker, and you're giving a talk in an auditorium at a design school in New York, and after the talk, nobody comes up to you and tells you what a great talk it was, hypothetically, that could induce cognitive dissonance. <laughs> and so what we tend to do um, when we, uh, we have these conflicting notions in mind, um, we seek to resolve that discomfort um, by altering our behavior, by changing some of the thoughts we have in mind. Um, but we don't like holding conflicting notions in mind, so we seek to we want to reduce the tension or the conflict that occurs. So we have a behavior we don't like, people being mean to each other online, and we have this notion of cognitive dissonance. Now what can we do with it? So this is a survey that you get at the end of a game of Dota. Games in Dota last anywhere from maybe a half an hour to over an hour, depending on what happens. And at the end of the game, you might get a survey that says, rate your enjoyment of the match. We can correlate that with all kinds of uh, wonderful things, and, and that's great. Um, so we start with this. A few months after we started asking people this, we introduced two more questions. We gave people randomly two more questions at the end of the match. One was this, uh, teammate cooperation. Please rate the cooperation your teammates displayed in the last match. So you can tell us how good of a team you thought you played with. Uh, in, in Dota, you're, you're, you're matched up with, it's two teams of five that are playing against each other, so you're usually playing with people you don't know, although you can um, party up with people you know. And so here we're saying, okay, you can assess your teammates. But really, the only reason we asked you this question was so we could ask you this one sometimes. Your cooperation. So please rate the cooperation you displayed towards your teammates in that match. So it's self-assessment. And so yeah, I can see people nodding and say so you might be able to see where this is going. So we have a tendency, I say players here, but it's really everybody, we want to rate ourselves highly. Um, when there's an opportunity to make a positive social comparison, we have a self-serving bias to say, yeah, we're good on this axis. Um, we also want to rate ourselves honestly. Um, you know, we can lie to ourselves. Um, it, it, it's tougher to do explicitly, but un unconsciously we, we have that bias sometimes. But really, we want to honestly say, yeah, we're good at this, whatever people are assessing. And so if you know that you acted poorly, then you cannot honestly rate yourself highly on that question. And so we're inducing cognitive dissonance. Right? You want to say, I was a good teammate, but you know that you weren't. These are conflicting notions. Um, and so to reduce that dissonance, um, we hoped that people would act in a way that lets them honestly rate themselves highly, but say, yeah, I actually was a good teammate. And so that's actually what we found. Um, so after we 
implemented this. Um, so I, I say reports of negative behavior here decreased by 12.5%. Uh, you can click on somebody's name in the game and report them and say this person was being toxic in some fashion. And so this is across millions of people and millions of games a day. Um, the overall incidence of negative reports decreased by 12.5%. So this is a reduction in the millions and essentially tens of millions and eventually hundreds of millions of these occurrences are no longer happening simply because we introduced two survey questions that take you know, a few seconds to answer at the end of a match. Um, you know, to me, that seems like a broad social impact. Um, the, the occurrence of online toxicity decreased by a significant fashion um, because of an intervention from psychology. And so I say the intervention worked. Um, and, and that's the important part. Um, I'm saying it worked because we had a measurable change in behavior. Um, we have reports in game and they decrease by a measurable amount. And so this leads into kind of the, the final part of the talk is that the ethos that we, we try and operate under, um, whatever we're doing is wanting to measure the impact of our decisions. Um, you know, we have ideas, we wanna know if they're good. We have game designs, we wanna know if they're good. Um, if you have interventions, you want to know if they're good, if they're effective. We're always curious about like, how do we measure the impact of these choices. Um, and maybe a more eloquent way of saying it, this is my favorite quote, and I try and put it in basically every talk that I give. Um, if it can be destroyed by the truth, it deserves to be destroyed by the truth. Um, we just want to know what the reality actually is. We don't want to believe what we want to believe. Uh, we want to believe what is actually true. And so we're always happy to test and experiment and gather data and figure out what's actually happening. And so if our cognitive dissonance manipulation or experiment had not worked, we would have tried something else. But the only way we'd know if it worked or not was if we measured the impact in some fashion. Um, so we're always after gathering data and trying to iterate off of it and to learn, you know, I guess essentially assess the quality of our decision making. It's data driven decision making. It's having an explanation for why we do what we do and it's basing it off of valid data and sound interpretations of that data. And it's, it's how you design good games and it's how you induce behavior change um, as psychologists, as therapists, as, as people inter interested um, in inducing social change. Um, and it's for us, it's, it's how we know we made the right choice. We try and use data to, to start to, to, I guess, generate a hypothesis and then we gather data after we test that hypothesis and complete that iterative cycle that I talked about in the beginning. Really, I guess the point that I'm hammering home is that we're just after measurable game design. Any change we make to the game should change the, the behavior of our players. Um, like our decisions should, in should induce an alteration in action. And for us, the goal is typically an increase in player happiness. Um, for people in the audience, it may be that. Um, it may be to teach autistic children how to, how to parse facial expressions or to, uh, to assess the efficacy of um, a therapeutic game acting as a palliative for burn victims. Um, whatever it is, um, we're all, we all have the same goal of creating a game mechanic that is inducing a change in behavior. And so maybe you guys can see the dichotomy or perhaps the, the false dichotomy I'm trying to set up here is that I'm not so sure I see a distinction between entertaining games and games for change. Um, we, we both have goals. Um, we're trying to increase player happiness or trying to increase awareness of the environment or, or what have you. But the games are the medium through which these changes in behavior are what we're trying to induce. And so just to kind of walk that thought through a little bit more, interventions in the lab, um, research in the lab, research in the real world. Um, there's not that big of a difference between that and game design. Game design is just research about how to design a game. Um, you know, different therapeutic interventions are research about how to treat somebody who is going through something. And so what's happening is that both these interventions and the goals of an entertainment game are just providing constraints for the game design, but we're both looking for measurable progress uh, on some particular axis. And so the, other, the next rhetorical question I have is are these really different processes? Like what's different about making a game for entertainment or a game for change? And so what I'm really trying to say is that when you're practicing science and creating knowledge um, or creating a therapy out in the real world. It should be the same for making games. And really, it should be the same for making all kinds of games, whether the goal is to make somebody happy or to make somebody more aware of how they're behaving or to induce some sort of therapeutic intervention. And so 
I guess the, the summary of the talk is, I think really, we're all making games for change. Thank you very much. Sure. So I think I'm about out of time. They said I wouldn't have time for questions, but I'll go stand out there if anybody has uh, uh, questions and wants to chat with me. And if not, feel free to, to drop me a line in my email. But thanks a lot, guys. <laughs>